Okay, um, I'm going to start a, a new series this morning that we're going to spend the next several weeks on, specifically entitled Understanding the Judgment Seat of Christ. Understanding the Judgment Seat of Christ. And I was, as I was praying about this, I've been praying about it the last several weeks, I, I was really thinking about the importance of this subject. Um, you know, of course, the, the message of the cross, eternal salvation, it's the most important message, calling people to salvation through Jesus Christ. If, if you've never given your life to Jesus and you're here this morning, I urge you, surrender your life to Jesus. Make him the Lord of your life. He loves you. He will cleanse you, forgive you, and he'll set you free from bondage. Uh, and for the believer, there's several other messages after salvation that are of critical importance. One is the knowledge of God, knowing the love of God knowing the way God thinks, the way he feels, what he's like, his emotions, how he feels towards us. Critical, critical. Secondly, I would say this message of having an eternal perspective, thinking about what's going to happen beyond this age, not just in terms of the issue of heaven or hell, but in terms of rewards, the ages to come, uh, understanding that we're all gonna give an account to the Lord, that we're gonna stand before the Lord, this is one of the most important messages and topics that I can bring to you. And so uh, I'm, I'm coming this morning asking for your focus, your attention. I'm asking Holy Spirit to, to release light. We prayed beforehand today, and I, I just told the Lord, I said, Lord, this is not about me preaching a message. This is about you calling our hearts into revelation. And I'm believing for our whole spiritual family that we would, we would have an eternal mindset. We would have a mentality that transcends just what am I gonna do this week, this year, you know, in this life. That we'd have a mentality that is locked in and clear about the ages to come and a critical, most important appointment that all of us have, and that's when we stand before Jesus. So uh, let me read this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, and then we'll pray and we'll get into the word. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So Father, here we are this morning, we come to hear the word, and, and Lord, I just confess, I am, I am not able in and of myself to do anything. I need the grace of God to teach and preach the word in a way that is clear and easy to be understood. So I'm asking this morning for your grace to rest on me, to declare the mysteries of the word of God, and I'm asking for Holy Spirit to bring attentiveness in this room right now to grip our minds with light, to release understanding to our hearts, to speak to us of the necessity of being alert and awake and understanding this most important appointment that we have, the judgment seat of Christ. So Lord, I'm asking, stand here with me, hold my hand, let me speak as an oracle, and I pray for the spirit of revelation to rest on us in the name of Jesus. And everybody that agreed with that said amen. Now listen, I know, talking about the judgment seat of Christ, because I've taught on this subject for many years, I know it's not one of these messages that makes you jump up and down and run around the room, I know that. But uh, the point is, my goal isn't to get you to jump up and down and run around the room. My goal is to get you prepared to stand before Jesus blameless and without fault. And so I, as a teacher, I was thinking about the passage that says, let not many of you desire to be teachers of the word because you will undergo a stricter judgment. And, and uh, another passage says a, a double judgment. And I think the, the idea is this, not only do I have to teach the word accurately, I now also, having stood in front of many, many people and shared the word, have to live what I've taught. And so uh, I feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to offer our spiritual family this series and this message as one of the most critical things that we can understand and a super 
uh, uh, serious help to the way that we live our lives in this age. So I'm even asking you on the front end, let's, let's not just hear this one and go, oh, he's gonna be on the judgment seat next week and, and just take off. Like, let's come all three, all three weeks and then you can blow Dustin off when he preaches. No, I'm joking. But let's, let's come and focus. I, where is he? I, I'm gonna be here front row, so I don't mean it that way. But I'm being funny. But here's the point. Let's come three in a row and let's get these thoughts deep into our hearts because it's that level of importance. I I feel so, uh, like I said, compelled by the Spirit to give this to our family because it is that important. So we read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Now here's the thing. Many believers, they live their life this way. They think, I got saved, I'm good. I'm good. And they kind of have in their mind this idea about the judgment seat, like, okay, I, I know I'm going to heaven, and then what happens is their theology has been informed by a cartoon or a movie where now they think what's gonna happen is they're gonna get in front of the pearly gates, St. Peter will be there with the book. How many's ever seen this picture? He's gonna look for your name, Oh, there you are, welcome in. And then they're gonna be standing there handing robes to everybody. And everybody gets the obligatory white robe. And then you walk into a cloud or something. And good, I made it. And our problem is that's not only is that not biblical, uh, but because we have this idea about the judgment about the ages to come that is some ethereal, sort of wispy, cloudy mentality, we actually don't live in a way that's responsible now. The lack of vision of those truths causes us to cast off restraint. And so many believers live this way. They think, well, I might have issues in my life, but you know, I've said yes to Jesus, so it's okay, it's all under the blood. And I would say this, the issue of salvation is dealt with if you surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord, but the issues of the sins, the compromises, the hidden things of the heart, the internal judgments, all those issues, if they are not repented of, you will have a conversation with Jesus about those things at the judgment seat of Christ, okay? And not only will you have a conversation with him about those things, the way that we live our life in this age will determine much of how we live our life in the ages to come. You don't just get the obligatory white robe. That is not biblical, that's not real. What is real is this, that Jesus' main motivator for calling people to righteousness all through the Gospels was the reality of eternal rewards. And what is real is that Paul, who taught the most about grace in the Scripture, also taught the most about the judgment seat of Christ. And what Paul unpacked for us was this, we're saved by grace, and then we're judged and rewarded based on works. That's very, very real. And so what I need to do is I need to unpack the word for you to connect how you live day in and day out to this very, very important appointment that you're gonna have when you stare Jesus in the face and he reviews every thought, every word, and every deed of your life And his desire is to reward you for every righteous act. Revelation 22, 22, 12 says this. He says, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. In other words, Jesus' mentality is I want to reward my people. In fact, even the term judgment seat, the Greek word is bima, bima seat. It literally means that, that, that word, what it, what it was originally for was the seat of award that athletes would go through when they would get medals after the, they would um, do athletic competition and they would get their medal. The Bema seat was where they would get the reward. 
So what's in God's design and in his, his mind is he wants to reward saints for every lean towards righteousness. He wants to reward you for every hidden act. Matthew 6, which I'll probably talk about next week, which I'll encourage you to read this week, it literally says several different times, the father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, now, let's just get our mind around that. He says, don't do your righteous works before men to be seen by them. He said, assuredly, I say the Pharisees do that thing, and, and they do their works in front of men. They sound a horn when they're doing a righteous act. He says, they have their reward. The entirety of their reward is given to them by them doing it for men's approval, to be seen by men. He said, but you... Your father, he goes, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. He says, do it in secret. And he says, your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, let me just be clear. The open reward isn't nobody saw me sweep the lobby and pastor is gonna bring me up and pat me on the back in front of the congregation. That is not the open reward. The open reward is I served, I didn't go for anybody's approval or any, any man's approval. I did it with a good heart as unto the Lord. And then on the day when Jesus comes and his reward is with him, he's gonna reward you for every righteous act done in secret. And the whole grandstand of heaven and all the saints from all the ages will see that reward. It's fascinating. I remember uh, growing up, I had braces. How many former braces wearers do we have? Many. I had braces. Well, they told me that I would only need to have my braces on for two years. And it took them four years to straighten out my teeth. And, and it wasn't their fault. And, and good night, did you see that? <laughs> no, I had to kill a ladybug in the first service during the message. It's like ladybug attack season. We bind the spirit of ladybugs. We bind all you ladybugs. This is nuts. We're having an infestation. Okay. This is a, this is a momentary light affliction that's working a far more eternal and exceeding weight of glory, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But I literally slaughtered a ladybug live in the first service. Okay. So I had braces. Took me four years to get them off. The reason why it took me four years to get them off is I skipped almost like every appointment I could skip. I just hated getting them tightened because it hurt my teeth so much. They didn't tell me that if I kept skipping my appointments, I was gonna have to wear them twice as long. But I was still paying all the way. If I skipped the appointment or not, they were still getting paid, so it didn't matter. And I was a teenager, so I blew things off. Now here's the thing. In that moment, my failure to consider the consequences caused me to have my braces on twice as long. Stupid little thing, right? There's an appointment that you and I, we can't blow off, we won't miss, we won't be late to. We'll actually be there exactly on time when the Lord says, and here's the point, acting like it's not gonna happen doesn't in any way stop it from happening. It's going to happen. There is an appointment you and I both have. You will stand before the Lord Jesus. You will give an account of your life. That is happening. It is an appointment in your future. And, and I wanna be so, so kind, but so bold as to tell you, not acting like it's real will not benefit you in that day. You've got to connect to this and then live your life day in and day out in the reality of it. Most believers, they only think about today, this weekend, my vacation this summer, and my retirement. They think about when I'm gonna get off work, what I'm gonna do for the weekend, what I'm gonna do for vacation, and what I'm gonna do when I retire. But I wanna tell you something, there's something so much more significant. What are you gonna do in the ages to come? What are you gonna do with Jesus in the coming ages? See, the coming ages, 
the Lord uses our life in this age to determine how we will live in the ages to come. See, most people are worried about where am I gonna spend the ages to come. I wanna ask you to think about how are you gonna spend it? And so there's all sorts of things that Jesus emphasized, rewards that, that connect this age to the next age. And that's what I want you to get your mind on, that there is continuity between how you live now and how you will live then. He says things like this, the meek will inherit the earth. That wasn't a figurative thing, that wasn't just a little slogan, try to get to people to be meek. He's talking about in the age to come, Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning, he's coming to earth. Everybody wants to go to heaven, I've got a news flash, heaven is coming to earth. Jesus is returning, he's going to rule and reign. And when he sets up his kingdom on the earth, he is going to have a leadership team from saints from this age. The last shall be first. That wasn't about be last in line on Tuesday and then on Saturday you get to be first in line. That's about living humbly and meekly in this age and in the next age the meek shall inherit the earth. They're gonna be a part of the leadership team. Does that make sense? And he thinks about it all the way down to, he said, even a cup of cold water given in the name of the Lord. Every little act, every righteous act, every small thing, stuff you've forgotten. I, so, some of you older saints, I just think about your life and you've been living for Jesus 60, 70 years and, and you have a, a history in God of serving Jesus faithfully all this time and you've forgotten more of the righteous acts than you can remember. And I mean, you're gonna stand before him, he's gonna open up the books, and he is gonna begin to walk you through every time you did a righteous act in his name, and he's gonna reward you for each one of them. I mean, it is gonna be mind-blowing. We're, we're gonna be in awe of some of the saints but when they, they stand before the Lord and they've got an 80-year history of faithfulness with nobody watching, faithfulness serving privately, praying and fasting, with never telling anybody, and the Lord is gonna openly reward. And that's his desire at the judgment seat. But I would be completely remiss if I didn't tell you the other portion of that verse that we just read. He says, according to what he has done, whether good or bad, good or bad. And I'm telling you this, there will be many who will stand before the Lord, and they will stand in a, in a, in a very <laughs> unthinkable arrogance, imagining that they got away with hidden things on this side. They'll imagine that the Lord didn't see, he didn't care, he didn't do anything about it. And they will stand before the Lord with hidden sin, and he will begin to walk through all the details. And I would just say this, if you have boldness, to not repent of hidden sin, attitudes, thoughts, inner judgments, anger, frustrations, I mean, all sorts of things that are not like him. If you have boldness not to repent of those things but to justify them, I'm telling you, you will talk to Jesus about those things. I don't, I don't, I don't do that to scare you, I do that to wake you. See, because everything we repent of in this age, under the blood. Anything we're bold enough to not repent of, there will be a conversation. Here's what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians chapter three, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. I was thinking about the, 
the makeup of fire. You know, fire, it, 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 it's not prejudice at all. It doesn't discriminate at all. Fire is fire, and when fire is applied, either what is put in the fire stands or what is put in the fire burns. And that, that terminology, I don't know if there really is like a, a, a glory fire that comes on the works and then we actually see this thing physically play out, but that idea of fire being what tries the works, he, he's talking about how Jesus is completely uh, unmanipulatable, how his standard is set, his standard is righteous, and how you cannot, you cannot kind of get by on him. Just like fire, it's, it's gonna burn it or it doesn't burn. It's either flammable or it's not. Jesus, his standard is set and, and, and you, you can't persuade. I was thinking about this hard thought. In the moment when fire hits many people's works, we will literally hear every excuse under humankind. All the excuses that people use today, they will try those on Jesus at the judgment seat. Well, Lord, I didn't know. And then he'll bring up the scene when he showed them. Well, Lord, I, I, someone else, they forced me to do that. And then he'll bring up the scene and show them, no, you weren't forced. You, you actually, this was revealing what was inside of you. And all of the different, all of the different, you know, excuses that everybody uses all the time. Well, I didn't go to church because all those hypocrites in the church. Well, none of those hypocrites forcefully stopped you from going to church. I mean, just all those things. Every one of those excuses that people use, they'll all come out at the judgment seat. And Jesus, you cannot, you cannot manipulate him. You can't talk him into anything. I have a dear friend and mentor, and when he's 20 years old, he had a dream. And in the dream, he's standing at the judgment seat of Christ. He's actually, um, he's actually there on his knees, and he's looking up, and he's just directly in front of Jesus. And Jesus looks at him with boldness, and he says, your life is saved, but it's been wasted. And the guy, he begins to say, but Lord, but Lord, I, I did all these things. I, I, I've been serving you, I, I mean, I'm, I'm 21. I've been serving you my whole heart these last years. What, what do you mean? He goes, saved, but wasted. And then immediately the Holy Spirit brings to his, to his mind the verse, it's appointed for men uh, to die and then comes the judgment. And he's, he knows he's at the judgment seat of Christ. And in the dream, he begins to wail. He's crying. And he looks down at his shirt, and his shirt is wet with tears. And he wakes up. And when he wakes up, he's in the middle of the floor in his, in his bedroom, curled up in a fetal position, just like in the dream. And he looks down, and his, and his shirt is the same shirt, and it's wet with tears. He'd been crying in his sleep while he was in this encounter. And immediately, the Holy Spirit speaks to him. And he's, like, he's asking the Lord, what is that? And, and the Lord said, I let you feel what it's gonna be like for people at the judgment seat who are saved by fire, but their life has been wasted. It was my mercy to let you feel that so that you don't ever waste the opportunities I give you in this life. And he told, he told me this, he said, you can't believe over the next 10 years in ministry, I'd go to pastor's gatherings and, and, and they would ask us about what we were doing. He said, well, I'm fasting, praying, seeking God and, and, and going hard. And he said, you can't believe how many times leaders would tell me, you just need to settle down and stop. Just calm down with all that. And, and, and all that, you don't need to do all that. Just, you need a little bit more vacation. You need a little bit, pay yourself a little bit more money. Take it a little bit more easy because God's not, you know, he, he, he doesn't need you to go as hard for him as you're going. And every, he said, he, he heard that a dozen times from leaders. He said the, the picture would come in his mind of that dream. He said when he was younger, he'd say, well, let me ask you this. 
When I stand before Jesus at the judgment seat, is your opinion gonna matter at all? <laughs> and they'd say, well, no. And he goes, well, then I'm not gonna listen to your opinion. He said, you know, after he got a little bit more mature, he realized that wasn't helpful. <laughs> it, never, it was never helpful. But beloved, if I, could sum, if I could put my hand on your head and cause you to get an eternal perspective right now, I would. Because in that day, the stuff that seems so important to us right now, it is gonna seem so, so small. It's gonna seem so, like we've wasted so much time. And there are so many things that are critically important right now that we don't put hardly any attention to, and I'm telling you, they will be the main issues in that day. So he says this, he says, fire is gonna try the works, and, and, and he says the day will declare what manner of work it is. He says that certain people, they're gonna show up there with works that are made out of wood, hay, they're, they're, they're gonna be made out of straw, and this is the way I imagine it. Somebody, maybe they're a Christian, maybe their life works are all emblemized in some kind of giant thing that they built some kind of skyscraper or something. And, and, and they walk in there, and that represents their life works. But they had hidden issues of unfaithfulness, laziness, unresolved anger issues and frustrations. They had inner judgments, all sorts of little compromises. They were lying, you know, and, and just manipulating, trying to get a, a foot up on other people. They, they, were, they were going in human ambition with an American mentality of how could they get in front of everyone else. And they use that mentality to build something enormous. And they walk in, and they set down this giant thing that they built, and it's all wood, hay, and straw. And then there's Jesus, and he's so kind. He loves us so much. And he looks at that, and he goes, oh, wow. That is a big deal. Let's go ahead and just see what happens when we put the fire on it. And in one millisecond, the entirety of the person's life turns into ashes. And they start making the excuses. And the Lord starts running the tape. Oh, I convicted you of that on this date, this date, this date, and this date. And each time, you justified your sin. Well, no, I directed you, son, this way, this way, this way, this way. And each time you decided you wanted to go your own way because it was too costly to go my way. He goes, and the outcome of that now, it's ashes. You're saved, but by fire. And then I think this, we're gonna have these people walk in there, and, and, and I believe those, we're gonna see many people that we will know their name. We will know their works giant things that humans really loved, and it'll, it won't stand the fire. Then other people will walk in. They will carry in something really small, and, and they'll put it before the Lord, and, and maybe it looks tarnished even, and then he'll drop the fire on it, and that thing that looked tarnished and small, that fire will cause it to just brighten up and gleam, and what we'll find is all these little works that were done in secret, all these little acts of faithfulness and kindness and love and servanthood, all these things, bang, when the fire hits that stuff, it is gonna be so glorious, so beautiful, so amazing, and the Lord is gonna, he's gonna reward that person. It's gonna be shown that what their works were was precious stones, gold and silver. And, and people that what is that? What is, who is that person? And it will be some little saint that nobody knew their name, that they, they live in faithfulness, all the days of their life, <laughs> they were quiet. They didn't try to get everybody's attention. They just faithfully served the Lord. They faithfully prayed. They faithfully fasted, shared the gospel. And when the Lord reveals their works, it is gonna, it is gonna glow radiantly. It's gonna gl glow beautifully. Beloved, that date is not figurative. That date's coming for you and I. There's about a half dozen verses in the New Testament that says he is able to present us before him blameless in that day. Oh man, I wanna be blameless before him in that day. And so 
One of my prayers has been, God, judge me now so I don't get judged then. Shock me right now. Shock me now so I'm not shocked then. It would be way better for me to get knocked off of my pedestal right now than in that day for the fire to fall on my works and it's all revealed as wood, hay, and straw and ashes. And if we could just be a people that could get this perspective that how we live in, our, in this age, how we live our lives right now has major continuity to how we live then, it will change the way we live right now. And little things, the way we live with our family, the way we live at work, the, the way we, we live with the people that know us the most, that, those are the, that's the most important place. Because here's what I figure, the people you're around the most, that's who it matters the most with by virtue of the fact that you're around them the most. It doesn't matter what you think I am in front of you, it's what my family thinks I am. Do you see what I'm saying? If it's not real with my wife, then, then it's just not real. It doesn't matter if everybody else, if the internet thinks I'm awesome, which it doesn't think I'm awesome, I get trolled quite a bit actually. <laughs> but, but the point, <laughs> The point is, it doesn't matter what kind of face or facade I have, what my Sunday morning look is. It's what's the hidden issue of the heart. And so this thing about the, how the works are gonna be revealed, man, if we could just get that so clear in our heart, this one phrase, is that anyone's work is burned, this phrase, he will suffer loss. He will suffer loss. That gets me. I, 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 that gets me. Teachers will incur a, a, a stricter judgment, a double judgment. I don't want to suffer loss when I'm in front of them. I want to stand blameless before him. I, I want to stand so, so purged in, by everything he's put on me in this age that I'm, I'm cleansed when I stand before him under the blood of Jesus. And, and here's the thing. When I sin, I want to repent of it. Come on. When you sin, repent. Like, really Repent. Like, call it out as sin. Say, that was sin. I shouldn't do that. I do not want to do that again. And then press against it. Press towards righteousness. He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for the heart that's pressing towards righteousness. That's what he's looking for. You make war on those sins and on those weaknesses. You make war on those. I mean, our leadership team, I tell them, I go, guys, guys, I get frustrated at times. I, I, I lose my temper. If I start getting frustrated, call me out. Call me out. Call it out, and then that way I will repent. I, I remember, I, uh, ben, I don't know if Ben Malasso is in the room, but Ben Malasso was in my leadership meetings for 10 years straight. I said, Ben, anytime, any place, if I'm talking and I'm in the flesh, just raise your hand. Seriously, I could just raise your hand. And in, in, you know, in 10 years, he, he hadn't standing like that a long time, in many meetings. <laughs> but in 10 years, he called me out several times, yes, I think you're in the flesh right now. But I did that, why? Because I don't want to sit there in, in my position with authority, smashing everybody, and then I don't have anybody checking me. So I gave them all the license, check me, call me out, and then if, if I'm in sin, I will repent. My daughter, she is the sharpest one to call me out. I don't know, Daddy. It sounded like you were starting to lose your temper with Mommy. Was I? Yeah, Daddy. It didn't sound nice at all. Yes, I repent. Why, though? Why repent quickly? Because I don't want to talk to Jesus about it later. And I don't want to have that junk in my life now. See, God, watch this. He looks at the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, 10 says he is the one who declares the end from the very beginning. I want you to get this about your life. God is looking at the end right now. He's looking at the end. And so what is he doing? He's taking you through the paces. He's taking you through the, the ups and the downs, the, the pressings and the blessings. He's taking you through all of that stuff right now with this in mind that in a day ahead you're gonna stand before him and he wants to reward you. And he's after something. He wants you to become mature in love. 
I remember this prophet had this judgment seat encounter and at the judgment seat, Jesus was asking everyone the same question. Did you learn to love? That was it. Did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? And I wanna propose to you this, the stuff you're going through right now, the good stuff and the bad stuff, the, the easy stuff and the trials, the stuff you're going through right now is because God has an intention for you. He's trying to conform you to the image of his son. He's trying to teach you how to love. Beloved, that's why he lets you go through it. I'm telling you, there's not one ingredient that's in your life that God is confused about. There's not one thing happening in your life that he didn't know was happening. He knows all of it. He knows all the pressings, all the ingredients, all the trials, all the blessings. He knows all of it, and he's trying to bring you to maturity and love. That's what he's after. So often, I see believers, and they're praying, 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 praying for something, and they don't get it. And then believer two, they, they kind of yawn the prayer one time. God, can I have the whatever? And they get it, bang. And believer one looks at believer two and goes, God's not fair. Believer two got what I've been praying for for 20 years. And what they don't realize is this. God gave it to believer two because what it's gonna evoke in believer two's heart is real love and gratitude. And he didn't give it to believer one because what it was gonna evoke in their heart was arrogance and pride. <laughs> we don't realize what he's keeping us from that is gonna keep us out of love. He will give you anything that will evoke a pure response of love in your heart, and he will cut you off from anything that will bring you away from love. He's trying to bring you to maturity in love. When God says no, he has the end in mind. We're looking at the weekend. God, can I go on this vacation? He goes, no. What? Come on, Dad, all my friends are doing it, you know. He's looking at the end. And so he's directing your life according to the counsel of his will, not in a way to, to keep you from joy, to bring you into joy, to bring you into love. But look, he's not looking at the time you get off work or this weekend or your vacation so much. He's looking at the day he looks through the pages of your life. Am I making sense? Look at this, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hear me, hear me right now. Our light affliction is working for us. It's working for us. What's it working? A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What's he talking about? He's talking about this. The trials that he allows you to go through in this age are qualifying you for eternal rewards if you look at the things that are unseen instead of the things that are seen. This is how it plays out. You go to your job. That person, everybody's got one of them in their life. That person that knows how to tap dance on your last nerve. They get their office or their desk moved or their schedule moved so they are right up next to you. And you're sitting there looking at that person, you're like, the devil, the devil, put them in my life. And that person, they know how to make your last nerve, and just know how to do it. They start off involuntarily, then they figure out what the game is, and they know how to nail you every single time. They only have to look at you sometimes. It's, huh? And they, ah. Oh. And then they wait for you to make a mistake, and they go, Christian, huh? And you're just like, the devil. And God's going, stop binding the devil. I put them there because I wanted you to see what's in your heart when a little bit of pressing comes. 
so that you could repent of it now instead of having to have the conversation with me about it later. See, that person, they're not making you angry. They're not making you frustrated. They're not making you impatient. They're they're not making you any of that. You are already that. You just know how to hide it around everybody else when everything's going well. So what the Lord does is he allows that person into your life to bring that momentary light affliction. It's momentary and it's light. So what, they've got a bad attitude, so you're worried about that, really? This momentary light affliction to cause you to get offended so that you can see the offense in your heart and then you can repent of it. We were in Pasadena. We're walking down the street and they had the Scientology guy coming out and he's asking all of us, he's, he's, I can see him approaching everybody and Scientology is a false religion. And I, I mean, I started getting full of myself as I was getting closer to this guy. I was like, oh, I'm gonna cast the devil out of him or something. <laughs> you know, we're walking down, walking down the street and he goes, hey there, no, 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 Scientology. I go, that's a false religion. <clears throat> that's, de- that's demonic, you're deceived. <laughs> real straight. He goes, have you ever done it? He starts coming in on me. I go, look, I'm a believer in Jesus. He goes, well, I'm glad you're acting like him. I went, nice talking to you, man. And, but it just so happened that wherever we were going, we had to go walking right past that guy like an hour and a half later. And uh, I was with my wife and Crystal and several. And Crystal goes, you know, you were kind of mean to that guy. So I'm like, oh. So I've got an option now. I can look at that guy, go up to him, double down on how much of a jerk I was being. I can ignore it, act like it didn't happen. The Lord sees, he knows my heart. Or I can look that guy in the eye and go, you know what, man, you're right. I wasn't acting like a Christian. I was acting a little bit arrogantly, and I'm sorry. Door number three, Johnny. So that's what I did. (laughs) Because I was so convicted. And I walk up to the guy, I go, hey man, I know we got in a thing a minute ago. I am so sorry. I said, you're right. I came across arrogantly. I said, I'm so sold out on Jesus, though. And I honestly, I just, I, I just honestly believe you're listening to a deceiving spirit. And, and I just want to encourage you just to just ask Jesus to reveal himself to you. And then he started trying to go on. I said, look, I don't want to do this anymore. But I'm really sorry I came across badly. But please forgive me. But I'm encouraging you to come to know Jesus. Bless you. And then walked off. And I'm, and I'm thinking about how many of those times in life where where you you don't make it right God gives you the chances and you don't beloved it's going to come out those light afflictions are to show you your own arrogances your own frustrations your own anger issue your own impatience your own tendency to lie or to round off the truth or to compromise All those light afflictions, they're geared to expose your heart so you'll own it now and ask him to forgive you and change you now. Does that make sense? Now, here's what Paul said. He made a huge statement about thinking of Jesus as just a means to this life and getting better in this life. He said it this way. He said, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, he said this. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. The, the New Living says it this way, and if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. And what's he saying that for? He's saying that the breadth of the gospel, it's so much, it goes so much further than this age that if all you're thinking about is Jesus as a means to your temporal blessing, you are so pitiful. You're, you're more to be pitied than anyone else because you have no idea where this thing is going, how grand the scheme is, how, how beautiful and wondrous the ages to come are. You have to understand this is far more than just about this life. This life, I like to say it this way, is the internship. The next age, we're gonna rule and reign with Christ. This is just the internship. And so, beloved, the next few weeks, this is what we're gonna be talking about. 
We're going to be talking about what, what does it look like at the judgment seat? What are the eternal rewards? How, how does this thing actually play out? We're going to be talking about having an eternal mindset and, and living for that day and not just living for the day-to-day. Because if you'll live for that day, your day-to-day will be radically impacted for the kingdom. Amen. And so, and so I, my prayer for us this morning is that this would begin to shift the way we think that, that the seriousness of this issue would begin to, to rest on our soul and that we would begin to live our lives more with that day in mind than this day in mind. Does that make sense? Amen. All right, come on, let's stand.